Hey everybody, it's Jeff Lee, Certified Criminal Trial Specialist practicing right here in Memphis, Tennessee. And I want to talk to you today about how does the Rape Shield Law work in Tennessee criminal cases. Very briefly, the Rape Shield Law is a rule of evidence here in Tennessee, Rule 412, and we're going to go into the specifics of it. When does it apply? Well, it applies when a defendant is charged with a serious sex crime, such as rape, sexual battery, incest, etc. That's when the Rape Shield Law is going to be a factor in a criminal case. The Rape Shield Law is a rule of evidence that prohibits certain kinds of evidence from being heard by the jury. That evidence is sexual behavior of the victim or the accuser. So if you're a defendant accused of rape, you will have additional restrictions on the kinds of evidence that you can introduce that other defendants in, say, a drug case, a theft, something like that, are not going to have to overcome. You'll see here that the proposed evidence can come in two categories of evidence, and that's reputation or opinion testimony and specific instances of conduct. Reputation or opinion testimony is almost never coming in, but there are certain cases where the specific instances of conduct can be admitted. Let's go to that next slide. You'll see that it is allowed in four different scenarios. Number one is when it's required by the state or federal constitution. Not much happening there. So let's go on to the second exception. And that is if the proposed evidence is introduced to show the credibility of the alleged victim. This is basically saying we need to show the jury why they should or should not believe this person. Now the prosecutor has to ask certain questions and the judge can limit how far you can go with it, but this is the second exception that allows specific instances. The third exception is when the defendant wants to talk about the sexual behavior of the victim, specifically with the defendant, or I think they call it the accused here. This is really the one that most often comes into play. Say, for example, that a defendant wants to tell the jury or show the jury through another witness, this individual and I have been sexually active for the last three years. We've been in a committed relationship. We've lived in the same apartment. And that's important because we don't want the jury to be thinking, what in the world is this guy doing in this woman's bedroom? And they're not even understanding that they have an existing ongoing relationship. They live together. And so that's really the scenario here. Now, this doesn't really prove anything. I mean, a person could still rape a person with whom they are in an ongoing relationship. But it's just important to let the jury know that uh, there's a whole range of situations going on between the defendant and the victim. You know, maybe they had an argument or maybe they had a custody dispute or a divorce. Or this was not sort of a, you know, shadow figure lurking in the dark. The fourth exception is when the defendant wants to talk about the sexual behavior of the victim with other people, other people than the accused. This is usually the one that defendants are most eager to introduce. They'll say, hey, this girl would have sex with anybody, but that's exactly what the rape shield law is intended to prevent. So this is probably the stickiest area. This evidence can be used, however, in four situations. Number one, if, or excuse me, three situations. Number one, to rebut or explain scientific or medical evidence. And that's sort of a blood work, pubic hairs, bite mark evidence, if that's your kick. And, uh, you know, this is the sort of stuff that you use to get after the state's expert witness. Next, you have to prove or explain the source of semen, injury, disease, etc. This is, um, you know, hey, she got an STD from the ex-boyfriend. He has the STD, she does too, and it's most likely that the person who raped her was him because maybe I don't have the STD. Or, you know, another situation you could say is, 
hey, there is semen all over the bed, and let's just imagine that they weren't able to get any sort of identifying DNA out of it. So the defendant wants to introduce evidence that she had sex with another man in the bed the night before to explain why that semen would not be his and the jury wouldn't uh, put him on the scene when that would be a mistake. The next scenario you have is a sort of a strange one here to prove consent if the evidence is of a pattern so distinctive and closely resembling the accused version of the encounter with the victim that it tends to prove that the victim consented. What in the world are we talking about here? Well, I can only think of one scenario that I'll give you. Say perhaps a prostitute has a unique scheme where she lures unsuspecting innocent men up to a particular hotel room and the man thinks that he's going to have sex with the prostitute when in fact he goes right into a dark hotel room and a pimp points a gun at the person and says, take your pants off, give me your wallet, and get out of here. Obviously this John doesn't want to report it to the police because he would have to uh, admit his own involvement. But say on one particular occasion, maybe this robbery went awry, and the police came on the scene and the prostitute said, hey, I was actually raped. Well, this man would want to introduce evidence of the fact that three or four other men had reported in the past that after having sex with the prostitute or perhaps before having sex with the prostitute, that they were also lured into this hotel room and, you know, they were stripped naked and told to get lost. And I can tell you this is from an actual case. This isn't wishful thinking on my part, strategic planning, uh, overactive imagination, etc. Now, I've got two slides here talking about the procedure for introducing this kind of evidence. I don't want to get too much into that because that's really your attorney's job to know that, not your job. But the point here is that you cannot wait until the last minute and say, uh, I just came up with this brilliant strategy. I want you to put all of this person's ex-lovers in a secret red folder. And then when she gets on the stand, say, look what I've got, the names of all your old sex partners. That's not going to work, not only because you can see you have to give notice of at least 10 days, you have to have a special hearing on whether the stuff is going to be allowed for the jury to hear it, why you're trying to introduce it, what exactly it is you're trying to introduce. And so even if you survive that hearing, the point is it's not going to be that Perry Mason moment where it has all this impact and punch and wow, uh, they caught me in the, you know, un unaware because they're going to be, have, they're going to have at least two weeks to sort of explain away whatever you wanted to introduce there anyway. Now, let's see what you've learned. Let's go ahead and test your knowledge a little bit here. And I've got a three-point analysis. Number one, I want you to ask, would the rape shield law apply to this offense? Two, what category of evidence is proposed? Is it reputation or opinion, or is it specific incidents of conduct? And lastly, what is the purpose for which the evidence is being offered? So let's try number one. Defendant is on trial for indecent exposure and wants to introduce testimony that the alleged victim has an online escort profile. Maybe she advertises on Backpage.com that she does some sort of Grecian rubdowns or something, and obviously this defendant would like for the jury to know that. Well, if you go through the first question, you'll see, does the rape shield law apply to this offense? And even though indecent exposure is uh, a sexual offense of sorts, it is not one in which the rape shield applies. So maybe that evidence of the Backpage.com profile wouldn't come in because it's not relevant. Maybe even if it is relevant, it's too prejudicial. But it won't uh, be stopped by the rape shield law. So that's good for that defendant. Scenario number two. Let's see here. Defendant is on trial for rape and wants to introduce testimony that the alleged victim was a prostitute 10 years ago. 
Well, you're thinking 10 years ago. But anyway, obviously the charge that the defendant is facing does initiate the rape, rape shield law. So that, that's our first question. Second is, what are we talking about here? Reputation, opinion, or conduct? Well, we're talking about conduct. We're talking about 10 years ago, you know, she had sex with people other than the accused, and that's not going to come in because uh, it's not being introduced for any of these exceptions as far as, you know, DNA, semen, bite marks, etc. So that's not going to come in for that defendant. Scenario number three, defendant is on trial for sexual battery and wants to introduce testimony that everyone in the neighborhood knew that the victim was promiscuous. Well, this is exactly what the rape shield law wants to stop. The rape shield law will prohibit this reputation testimony. Scenario number four, defendant is on trial for aggravated rape and wants to introduce testimony that the alleged victim has lied about being raped in the past. Well, this one is a lot more interesting. If you go back to the slides I gave you before about specific instances of conduct, you'll see that number two is the evidence being offered by the defendant on the issue of credibility of the victim. Now you'll see that the prosecutor still has to introduce certain kinds of evidence and the judge can still limit it. And so the rape shield law will prohibit this unless the prosecutor or the victim sort of open the door to it and walk into it. But that's the kind of evidence that you sort of have waiting in your pocket. And if the stars align, if a certain, certain few things happen right at the trial, maybe it would not have been admissible in the beginning, but because of certain actions that they take, it's later admissible. So that's sort of a 50-50. A Scenario five. Defendant is on trial for rape and wants to introduce evidence that the alleged victim slept with another man previously to show that the semen found on the bed is not his. In this instance, the rape shield law will allow specific instances of conduct of sexual behavior with other persons to explain the source of semen. So, you know, going back to my specific instances of conduct, you'll see that this falls under subcategory number four, two, and it will be admissible. Scenario number six, defendant is on trial for sexual battery and wants to introduce testimony that he and the alleged victim were making out in the bar earlier that night in front of everyone. Okay, and this, you'll go back to my slide, specific instances of conduct, and you'll see under, let's see, four, uh, no, excuse me, three, the specific behavior with the accused is being introduced on the issue of consent. So the rape shield law will allow specific instances of conduct because it is sexual behavior with the accused and it's to show consent. Now, obviously this is not an exhaustive uh, explanation of the rape shield law, but I hope it's sort of a quick and dirty, if you'll excuse the pun, on this Tennessee Rule of Evidence 412. And let me just say, <clears throat> excuse me, very briefly, if you have been accused of committing a sexual offense, this is not something that every attorney's dealt with, okay? There are attorneys out there who've been doing drug cases, thefts, uh, you know, automobile accidents, whatever. Maybe it's all in the sphere of criminal. But the point is that this only comes into play when you do sex offense cases. Okay, so somebody could be a real whiz at drug cases. They may know how many grams and ounces, you know, uh, turn into a felony and, and if you can convert this and that. Uh, but none of that stuff really has anything to do with sex cases. So you need an attorney with experience on sex offense cases or they're not going to know this stuff. And you're not going to be able to fix it on an appeal. You're not going to be able to fix it in a post-conviction if they don't get it right the first time. This attorney could mess up because they could be wrong about saying, oh, you can't introduce that, when in fact you could. Or they could mess up in the middle of the trial, miss that opportunity to introduce some of this evidence. Or even worse, they could encourage you, and you've got 
you know, three dummies outside thinking that they're going to get all this evidence in, and oops, and next thing you know, uh, they've upset the jury, upset the judge, and they say, oh, Mr. Such-and-Such, such, you should have known better. That wasn't admissible. If you wanted to introduce that kind of testimony, you would have had to file something 10 days ago. We would have had to have a hearing on it. So it could be that um, it would be admissible, but they don't know that there's a whole procedure on it. Anyway, I've got other free materials on my website, www.mysexcrimeattorney.com. I hope that this video was helpful for you, and I wish the best of luck in your case. Music